Welcome, everyone. Welcome. Good, good evening. My name is Naomi Krogman. I want to welcome you to the Peter Lougheed Lecture tonight with Councillor Michelle Wilsden. Michelle Wilsden is from the Enoch First Nation. The Peter Lougheed College and the City of Edmonton are pleased to partner on hosting one of our nearby leaders from the Treaty 6 region. We would first like to gratefully acknowledge holding this event in the Treaty 6 First Nations territory and convey the hope we have at the University of Alberta to be a positive force in addressing the calls to action in the Truth and Reconciliation Committee and Commission. I am a professor in the Department of Resource Economics and Environmental Sociology and also an Associate Dean at the Faculty of Graduate Studies and Research. I am pleased to welcome you to this third lecture in our series for the Lougheed College Lecture Series. In the spring of 2014, the Right Honorable Kim Campbell was appointed the founding principal of the Peter Lougheed Leadership College. The vice principal of the Peter Lougheed Leadership College is Dr. Martin Ferguson Pell, who is also a professor in the Faculty of Rehabilitative Medicine. The Peter Lougheed Leadership College is for third and fourth year undergraduate students from across all the faculties here at the U of A who go through a creative, demanding, and immersive leadership training program. The broad purpose of this college is to foster an opportunity for students to discover what leaders need to know. Attending these lectures is part of their interdisciplinary learning. The purpose of this lecture series is to expose students to cutting edge approaches and topics relevant to leadership in today's ever-changing society. These lectures provide a wonderful opportunity for all of us at the U of A and in the broader community to learn from outstanding leaders in our society. Tonight's event will run until 7.15. It will start with a lecture by Councillor Wilsden, followed by a conversation between the speaker and the Right Honorable Kim Campbell. During this address tonight, we ask that you do not take any audio or video recordings. We welcome you to enjoy the bannock and fruit generously provided by the City of Edmonton. With that, I will turn this over to City Councilor from Ward 6, Councilor Scott McKean, to introduce Michelle Wilston. <clears throat> Thank you. It's uh, really great to be here. I was in a council committee meeting all day, sitting next to politicians, and it's good to be away from them. <laughs> uh, it is a pleasure to be here on behalf of Mayor Don Iveson and the rest of council uh, to welcome you to this speaker series and introduce Councillor Michelle Wilsden. And I would like to also begin by acknowledging that we are gathered here on Treaty 6 territory. I thank the diverse indigenous peoples whose ancestors' footsteps have marked this territory for centuries, including the Cree, Dene, Soto, and Nakota Sioux peoples. Together we call upon all our collective honor traditions and spirits to work in building a great city for today and future generations. I also want to acknowledge that I'm a U of A dropout. <laughs> so that's the message we want you to leave with here tonight, is that you really should just drop out of school. Is that right? Yeah, something like that. Um, but it's, it, it thrills me to come over here and speak at the U of A. Uh, it was a blessed time in my life, though I did not complete that degree, but it is my plans in the future to do so. I'm pleased to see so many students and community members here today. I know this lecture will yield valuable insights for you. Today, Councillor Wilson is going to speak about working towards the greater good with groups of people. This type of work, whether it's in government, private industry, or the nonprofit sector, is immensely challenging. Often, moving the needle towards greater good requires some parties compromising on issues they may care about knowing how to pick your battles and fight another day. As a leader, this is a challenging situation to face that requires strong relationship management and negotiation skills. 
It's a task that I imagine Councillor Wilson has run into a fair number of times in her work creating community economic development in First Nations communities, blending the interests of industry, community, and different levels of government. And it's been a personal privilege to get to know uh, Michelle. Uh, the City of Edmonton and uh, Enoch First Nation have been working on an economic development partnership, and I was one of the uh, councillors, lead councillors on that, got to go out and do a sweat uh, with members of the Enoch First Nation, uh, and afterwards joined together in a celebration of that. And uh, Michelle, the other thing that, that I was really struck by, she told me one time that she actually uh, lived in Oliver in Ward 6, the, the ward that I represent, and I think she moved out the next day after I was elected, if that's, is that true? No? Okay. Uh, uh, so Councillor Wilson is not only a leader in the Enoch Cree Nation, but is actively involved in public life in the city of Edmonton as well. It's been a real privilege to get to know her a bit and to work with Michelle on the Memorandum of Understanding Initiative between the City of Edmonton and Enoch Cree Nation. She's been a tremendous, tremendous advocate for her community and a great leader for this project. I look forward to hearing her insights on leadership and finding commonality with others. Please join me in welcoming Councillor Michelle Wilsden to the stage. <laughs> Michelle. Well, good evening, everyone. Thank you to Naomi and Scott for that really warm welcome. I, I don't know who wrote that stuff, but it sounds really great. <laughs> um, you know, I, I just have to say I'm really happy to be here tonight. I'm, I'm looking so forward to the conversations that we're going to have a little later on this evening. But for now, I've been asked to spend about 40 minutes uh, sharing some thoughts with you about decision making for the greater good. And so. Um, usually when I'm asked to speak at public engagements, I'm asked to come and talk about things like economic development or First Nations governance or planning. Um, but this is the first time I've been asked to talk about decision making. So in preparing for tonight, I really had to sit down and think about it. I had to reflect on the things that shape my choices as a leader. And I learned some new things about myself, which is really cool. And I look forward to kind of sharing some of that with you tonight. Uh, so my plan really is just to share a bit about myself which I hope will you know, provide some context about how I came to be in this position. I'm going to share with you some of the key influences throughout my life that have really shaped how I make decisions as a leader today. I will give a couple of examples to you about the kinds of decisions I make, as well as some of the opportunities that you know, I get to work on that, that Scott just mentioned. Um, and ultimately, my goal is just to give you a different perspective about leadership. So we'll start there. Uh, I didn't wake up one day and just decide to be a leader. When I was a little girl, I never said that when I grew up, I wanted to be a band counselor. Um, I didn't go to school to be a leader. I didn't take any kind of special training. Um, you know, truthfully, when I was little, I wanted to be a scientist when I grew up. I was one of those kids that annoyed my family with 100 million questions about every little thing. And so I don't think that they were surprised when I grew up studied the sciences, and went on to become a geologist. Uh, what I think is surprising to most people is that I studied geology, ended up making a career in community economic development, and then somehow ended up into public office. So I'm going to share a little bit about how I ended up here, and I think the best way to do that is to start in the beginning. Um, I was born in August of 1982 in a hospital that was coincidentally named after a Canadian geologist named Charles Campbell. Um, I lived in Enoch with my parents and my siblings until I was about two years old. Um, at that point, my dad took me and my siblings and raised us off reserve for reasons that I'm now beginning to understand. We spent some time in Calgary and then later moved on to a remote area of British Columbia. Uh, my dad was a person that was very politically active throughout the 1970s and 80s. He was a part of the indigenous rights movement that was sparked from the 1969 white paper. And Although my dad had to set aside his career because, of course, he was a single father raising three kids, his passion for these issues never faded. So I grew up in a household where there was always conversations around Indigenous rights. My dad spent a lot of time you know, teaching me about values and helping to build my, understand about, my understanding about the treaties. 
You know, I, I was also growing up around the same time that the Canadian law started to evolve around uh, recognizing treaty and in Indigenous rights. And so there were a lot of conversations around the kitchen table um, that would be really meaningful to me later on as I grew older. Uh, you know, as time passed, I got a little older and inevitably became, you know, more curious about my family and my community, and, and I needed to know where I, come, where I came from. So when I was 14 years old, I jumped on a Greyhound bus and I made my way back to Alberta and eventually out to the reserve. You know, the whole way there I had this picture in my mind about this huge family with a hundred cousins and, you know, everyone was speaking Cree to one another and eager to teach me about my culture and, and my history and my language. When I got there, that's not at all what I found. I mean, aside from the hundred cousins, I do have hundreds of cousins. Um, but that's not what I found. What I found was a lot of poverty. I found a lot of alcohol and drugs, abuse and dysfunction. You know, it's, it's not that I was unfamiliar with alcoholism or poverty. I grew up poor. You know, my dad struggled with alcohol when I was little and, and so I wasn't unfamiliar with these things. It was just the magnitude of it when I came to the reserve was shocking to me because it was everywhere. And I think it was shocking to me because I didn't know anything about the residential schools and the harmful legacy that it had on communities. It's not something my dad ever talked about. You know, it's not something anybody really talked about until the Truth and Reconciliation came around. So, you know, overall, it wasn't a very positive experience for me coming back to the reserve. Some bad things happened to me when I was there. I started to wander down a path that included drugs and alcohol. I became depressed, and I knew at some point that I needed to leave Enoch if I was ever to make something of my life, and so that's what I did. When I was 17 years old, I reached out to the Boys and Girls Club of Edmonton, who helped me get an apartment in Oliver, <laughs> downtown. Um, I, so with my own apartment, I got a part-time job, and I enrolled at Centre High, and that's where I went to high school, and that's where I graduated from. Uh, I would later on go on to university, and I graduated from the University of Victoria uh, with a major in geology. I, after, you know, throughout that time, I was able to spend a couple of field seasons as a rock hound in the northern uh, Canadian Arctic, as well as northern British Columbia. And as you can probably guess, I didn't end up pursuing a career in geology, because I'm here today. Um, instead, I found myself pursuing a career in community economic development. Um, and that in itself is a long story that basically starts with the collapse of the mining industry in 2009. So jobs in, in the field were pretty scarce for junior geologists like myself. I was living in North Vancouver and I had a boyfriend who proposed to me and then ran off to Edmonton to pursue a career opportunity and I didn't hold it against him because there weren't a lot of jobs for, for graduates and, and young uh, professionals at the time. So, uh, since I'd agreed to marry him, I felt obliged to follow him back out west, and that's what I did. I, I, you know, I relinquished the position I was working in in North Vancouver, and I followed him back to Edmonton. I just took a leap of faith that everything would work out when I got here. Um, as it would happen, the stars aligned for me because uh, when I got here, I was introduced to an organization called CANDU. It's a, for those of you that don't know, it's a national Indigenous organization that really focuses on capacity building for Indigenous communities around community economic development. Um, so CANDU had this partnership with Natural Resources Canada, and together they were looking for somebody that could help um, go out and work with Indigenous communities to try to build understanding about the mining cycle so that communities could better plan and prepare for opportunities that were coming through in the way of business and employment at each phase of the mining cycle. So I took a job with CANDU, and that was some of the work that I was able to do when I was with them. I ended up staying with the organization for about four years, and in that time, I got to develop and lead some really cool projects that had me working with, you know, different industries, organizations, communities, levels of government all across the country. And in that time, I learned so much about community economic development, some of the challenges that our communities face. Uh, I intersected with and learned from so many incredible leaders who were dedicated to helping their communities become the kind of place where young people didn't have to leave to succeed. 
you know, people that were dedicated to rebuilding their nations. And let me tell you, nation building is a super complex and massive undertaking. You know, it requires people that can, you know, fight for social justice and the adequate social programming that we need in our communities. It requires people who can help to restore our languages and our traditions. It requires people that can, you know, bring critical infrastructure like housing, schools, and clean water to our communities. It requires people who can help protect our lands and our rights. And it requires people that can help build economies that can generate the revenues to support all of those other things. I decided to become one of those people. I spent about four years in the nonprofit sector before I ended up uh, moving over to the government of Alberta, where I would eventually become the Director of Economic Development for the Ministry of Indigenous Relations. And in 2015, I was elected into Council of Enoch Cree Nation. So, as you can tell, it was a very indirect path to leadership for me. And, you know, although I'm a rookie, I'm not as seasoned as my friend Scott here, but, uh, you know, but I do understand probably what is the most important thing, and that is that this role is not about power, it's not about authority, it's about the deep and sacred responsibility to my people who have elected me to lead them, and I take that so seriously. I feel like as a counselor, my job can kind of be boiled down to three major things, which is, one, establishing a vision for the future, two, implementing solutions to the many challenges that we face, and three, making decisions. Every single day I have to make decisions. Um, you know, sometimes the decisions I have to make are really clear. Sometimes they are really complex, and sometimes they're very controversial. So at the end of the day, I just have to do my best to make decisions according to what I feel is the right thing to do. Um, and so I want to spend a little time talking about a few of the influences that help to shape my beliefs about what I think is right and what is wrong, and ultimately the way that I make decisions as a leader. So most of you, I think, will remember the Idle No More movement of 2012 and 2013. Uh, this movement was primarily in response to a stack of federal bills that had made their way into the House of Commons with little to no consultation with Indigenous people, and these bills would hugely negatively impact them. So for me, the Idle No More movement was really an awakening. It was a realization of just the scope of the injustices that Indigenous people were facing in this country and still face in this country. It stirred to life within me all of the teachings that my dad had taught me about treaty as I was growing up. And it represented the moment that the spirit and the intent of Treaty 6 found a home in my conscience. I protested, I marched the streets with my brothers and sisters figuratively and literally. I called, I joined them in calling upon the federal government to uphold the honor of the crown and its dealings with indigenous people. The Idle No More movement had a lot of supporters. People from all kinds of people, all kinds of Canadians that stood in solidarity with indigenous people. But it also had a lot of critics. Um, people who disagreed with it in principle, there were people who were just inconvenienced that the protests were, you know, had on their daily commute. And there were a lot of people who just didn't understand what Idle No More was about because their Canadian education had failed to give them an accurate history of our country. You know, the Idle No More movement also shined a light on the racism towards Indigenous people that are still entrenched in this country, in this city, and I'll argue even here on this campus today. You know, many of you in the room may have stood beside us. Many of you may have been a voice of opposition, and that's okay, too. You know, I actually enjoyed the criticism and the debates. You know, I, I read the paper, all of the opinions and responses that were published in the National Post and the Globe and Mail, I found interesting. I thought the, discor the discourse around I don't know more was good for Canada because it encouraged some critical thought around some really important national issues. It was the same critical thought that helped me to form some really practical ideas about what treaty impl implementation actually meant, and it would be those ideas that would help me to make decisions today and, and in the future as a leader later on in life. So, 
Another significant event that I want to touch on, of course, is the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Canada. Um, I hope that by now, every single person in this room understands the truth of the history of the residential schools in Canada. And if you do not, I implore you to take the time to learn. At the very least, read the 94 Calls to Action, and even better, commit yourself to being a part of the solution because it's important to every single person in this room and every person in Canada. Um, for those of you that don't know all that much about the TRC, I'll just give you a little bit of information. The Truth and Reconciliation Commission was established as a part of the Indian Residential School Settlement. This was the largest class action in Canada's history. The students of the former schools didn't want their stories to be lost as a result of settling out of court. So in 2008, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission was founded, and its mandate was to um, collect the written and oral history of the residential schools and work towards reconciliation between the survivors and the rest of Canada. Uh, the final of the seven National Truth and Reconciliation events was held here in Edmonton, and I attended all four days. For four days, I sat and I witnessed the heartbreaking testimony of the survivors that went to those schools. I heard for the first time in my life, believe it or not, the first time in my life, the kinds of stories of the things that happened in those schools, the schools that my grandparents went to, that my parents, my aunts, my uncles, my cousins went to. And for the first time in my life, I think I really understood the scope and the impact that residential schools had on my community. It was the first time I realized that I, too, am an intergenerational residential school survivor. You know, I haven't talked much about the things that I've experienced, but I can tell you that I did not escape sexual abuse. I did not escape the impacts that alcohol and addictions had on my family. I did not escape trauma. But for all of my life, I didn't understand it. And the Truth and Reconciliation Commission changed that for me. You know, for the first time, the trauma that I carried through my life had some meaning, and I can't tell you how powerful that is. With the truth, I could heal, I could forgive, and I could move forward. And I think that's what the TRC did for a lot of Indigenous people in this country. You know, through this experience with the TRC, I found a lot, of, lot more patience and kindness you know, in my own heart for people that haven't been able to heal. People like my mother, who have been estranged to me you know, practically my whole life. I don't judge alcoholics or drug addicts anymore for their weakness. I pray for their strength. I, I see a homeless woman on the street, and the first thing that comes to my heart is love and compassion, because that person could be my mother. She could be hurting inside, but now I understand why. You know, the, the reason I'm sharing this with you is because I was asked to come and talk about decision-making for the greater good. And we cannot lose sight of the fact that the greater good are people. And in this case, they're my people. They're people who have the same story as me, who share the same history, the same trauma, who share the same hope and the same future as me. So it's impossible for me to disconnect my history with the decisions that I make today as a leader. For the greater good, I must not let the 150 years of the suffering of my people be in vain. I have to draw from that experience the understanding, the courage, the strength, and the love to do this job. And yes, Indigenous leaders need to love their people, even if it is tough love. Another significant influence on my day-to-day -day decision making is, of course, Treaty Number 6. I'm not going to go into a lengthy lecture about Treaty 6, and I would argue that there's people far more qualified than I to do that, people here at the U of A, and, and I'm sure if you reach out and you're interested, you can find those people who'd be willing to teach you. Um, but I think it will suffice to say that my ancestors entered into a treaty relationship on behalf of the Cree nations, Enoch and Papas Chase, um, that I come from, just as many of your ancestors will have entered into a treaty relationship on behalf of the Crown, now vested in Canada. You know, I guess you could say that 
I'm a treaty person twice over because I have a grandmother who is a Scottish descendant of a Canadian settler. And so I have an obligation to uphold the treaty from both sides. I vote in provincial, federal, and provincial elections so that I can elect governments that will uphold their obligation to the treaty. I think it's both my right and my duty. You know, I, I think it's important that each of you know, and hopefully come to understand at some point, that the spirit and the intent of Treaty 6 that my ancestors entered into is not the same as the written text of the treaty that Canada clings to. In my view, unless this fundamental conflict is resolved, there will never be a true nation-to-nation -nation relationship in this country between Canada and Indigenous peoples because the guiding principles of those relations have never been properly established. You know, there's some talk right now in Ottawa about modernizing or renegotiating the number of treaties of Canada. And I'll go on a limb here and say that maybe this isn't such a bad thing. Not if it creates some common understanding about the principles and the mutual obligations of our treaty relationship. You know, maybe clarity is just what we need to move forward, and this could be the mechanism by which the Crown, vested in the Government of Canada, finally acknowledges and comes to respect the true spirit and intent of Treaty 6. Take a pause. Thirsty. So, as leaders, we must be mindful of our obligations to uphold the treaties, and I think that you know, every single Indigenous leader will agree with that statement and principle. But many Indigenous leaders can't agree on exactly what that means in practice, and I'll give you an example. Uh, many Indigenous people have this deep-rooted belief that we should deal exclusively with the federal government. We've been taught that dealing with any other level of government or dealing outside of the Indian Act will somehow derogate or abrogate from our treaty relationship. You know, many, many live in fear of derogation and abrogation so much, though, that they don't do anything. And as a result, many of our nations have been paralyzed, sitting around and waiting for the federal government to honor its obligations to the treaty relationship. To demonstrate this point, let's take a look at the education clause of Treaty 6. This clause, interpreted in a modern context, is understood that the federal government will provide a education to each Treaty 6 nation for each Treaty 6 nation that desires it. So therefore, we have a treaty right to education, which I will also point out is also a human right and a constitutional right. So you can consider Indigenous people, especially those here in Treaty 6, as having a treaty right to education as well as constitutional and human rights education. So we have rights plus. Um, and I think that everyone should agree that the federal government has done a horrible job in upholding its obligations to our treaty rights as well as our human and constitutional rights for Indigenous people on reserve. You know, there's, there's a statistic out there from some studies done that uh, schools on reserve are grossly underfunded compared to provincial schools off reserve. Uh, you know, there's an Indigenous student attending school on reserve will receive about $9,500 per year for her education, while a non-Indigenous person off reserve will receive $14,000 for her education. That's a 47% increase. As a direct result of the funding inequities, you know, educational outcomes for Indigenous... Oops, sorry. Indigenous uh, educational outcomes for Indigenous people are lacking. We suffer in graduation rates, we suffer in literacy and numeracy levels. Instead of rights plus, I say that we get rights minus, and the federal government fails in its obligation to uphold our basic rights. You know, the government of Alberta recognized this injustice, this, this inequity, and continually called upon the federal government to increase funding for Indigenous students on reserve to be at par with what uh, students get in provincial schools. The federal government failed to do so, and so the province came to the table and started to collaborate with Indigenous leaders, producing what would become the Memorandum of Understanding for First Nations Education in Alberta. 
Uh, this MOU would set out a comprehensive framework for working together to address the educational outcomes for Indigenous students in the province. So here we have a partner who's recognizing an injustice, who is at the table with a desire to collaborate and be a part of the solution. Yet the resistance from the Indigenous community was strong, and it was widespread. You know, there were a lot of First Nations who chose to work with the province, and there were a lot of First Nations who chose not to, and there was no consensus among Indigenous leaders about the MOU. You know, most of the resistance to the MOU and the provincial partnership was, in my view, based on this notion that collaborating with the province would derogate from our treaty relationship because education was a federal responsibility. It didn't matter to the dissidents that the federal government consistently failed to meet its obligations to provide adequate funding for First Nations education. It didn't matter that treaty rights had already been enshrined in the Constitution, protected by Canada's highest law. It didn't matter to the dissidents that it didn't matter to the dissidents that the MOU had clear non-derogation and non-abrogation clauses. What mattered to the dissidents was that First Nations education was a federal responsibility. It was better to wait for the federal government to do something to honor our treaty, allowing our children's education to suffer in the meantime. And I think that's nonsense. If I was a leader at the time, I would have been at the table. And I'll give you a reason why. So in Enoch, we have the Kateskano School that educates about 350 students from kindergarten to grade 12. In 2015, I was newly elected into office. I'd only been on the job for about three months when I received this report of Canadian testing of basic skill results for uh, Kateskano students. And I will never forget that day because that was the day when all this rhetoric about this education gap became very real to me seeing with my own eyes how the children's education in our school had been neglected. From kindergarten to grade 12, our students fell drastically below national averages in reading, language, math, and other basic skills. By grade 12, our grade 12 students were performing work at a nine grade level, and for two years in a row, we had one high school graduate. One. It was clear to me that we were failing our children and we had to do something. So we reached out to the Edmonton Catholic and Edmonton Public School Boards, and it was the Edmonton Catholic School Board that actually came to the table. They offered to help us conduct a review of our curriculum and make the, and make the changes that would be necessary to get our kids performing academically at the levels that they should be at. Uh, they offered to provide us with expertise in numeracy, literacy, and administration. Uh, the province reached out and wanted to support our partnership with the Catholic School Board. I mean, we were all in, and it was for the children. But I can tell you that, that the decision to reach out for help created dissent in my community. It created dissent even among leadership of my community. And this dissent brought forward this old position that First Nations education is a federal responsibility. And I just disagreed. You know, yes, the federal government has the responsibility to fulfill its treaty obligations and support First Nations education, but the way I see it, as a leader, the education our children receive in my community is first and foremost my responsibility. I take responsibility for those children, and in that, I have to act now because I see that their education is suffering. You know, I agree that we have to continue to call on the federal government to be good treaty partners, but I think it's reckless to allow our children's education to suffer for federal failures. You know, the, the partnership with the Edmonton Catholic School Board, it hasn't been smooth. I don't know if it's working the way that we hoped that it would because I haven't seen test results yet. It's too soon to tell. But at least we're doing something because the cost of doing nothing is too great when you look at those kids and you think about their future. You know, in fact, I would argue that taking action doing something is honoring the treaty. You see, in my view, the spirit and the intent of Treaty 6 was to peacefully coexist on this territory as sovereign nations, sharing in its resources, relating as partners, and striking the balance between colonization 
and preservation of the land so that we could continue to practice our traditional ways of life. The day before treaty, we were sovereign nations. We had our own languages and traditions. We had our own laws and governance structures. We had our own education system. We had land and a responsibility to that land that was grounded in our spiritual connection to the Creator and Mother Earth. The day after treaty was signed, it was broken, but not by us. The day after treaty was signed, our people were forced onto reserves, forced into residential schools, the Indian Act was passed, which stripped Indigenous nations from making decisions over their day-to-day -day lives. Speaking our language and practicing our ceremonies were outlawed, and we were forcefully prevented from connecting with our ancestors and the Creator and our spirituality. The day after treaty, treaty was broken by not by us, and for the past 150 years, the Government of Canada continues to fail to uphold its treaty obligations to Indigenous people in Canada. But that doesn't mean that Treaty 6 is null and void. The treaty will always live on because it has a spirit and it has a purpose. And I say that because Treaty Number 6 represents a permanent relationship between the Crown and Indigenous people in this territory. And as long as Indigenous people are here, so will be our treaty relationship. You know, we survived residential schools. We survived genocide. We're not going anywhere. And neither are our treaty obligations to one another. So in my mind, the best way to honor treaty is to go back to the day before treaty, the way we were the day before treaty. To do this, we must be courageous enough to shift away from the current paradigm of colonialism and begin to exercise the jurisdiction that sovereignty intends. This shift requires that we rebuild our nations and strengthen the laws and institutions through which we govern. It requires that we reclaim and embrace our culture, language, and ceremonies that define the indigenousness of our nations. It requires that we heal from our past and establish new visions for the future. It requires us to change the way that we think and to be free to engage in partnerships that advance the quality of life for our people. You know, the treaties were not intended to paralyze our nations. They were intended to protect our nationhood and empower us to make the decisions that will advance our interests. And they intended mutually beneficial partnerships, much like the one that we have with the city of Edmonton. And I'm going to share some insight as to why this relationship is significant for Enoch Cree Nation. But first, I want to preface this case study with uh, a comment just saying that the partnership I'm going to be describing or the significance of the partnership I'll be describing about the City of Edmonton is going to be pretty narrowly defined within the context of joint planning and economic development. And of course, there are many and just as important reasons as to why this partnership makes sense for Enoch, but for the interest of time, I'm going to really narrow the focus. So I want to begin by going back again to 1982, not because it was the year I was born, but because it was the year that the last major annexation occurred with the city of Edmonton. Uh, this annexation would double the size of the city, and it would also bring the borders of Edmonton right to Enoch's doorstep. Uh, shortly after annexation, Edmonton began intensive planning for its newly acquired municipal lands. Uh, the Lewis Farms Area Structure Plan was adopted in 1988, followed by the Grange Area Structure Plan a decade later. And these would become the two neighborhoods directly adjacent to Enoch in the, northwest, uh, sorry, in the northeast corner. At the same time, Enoch was continuing its own plans for development of that, of that area, um, where the current site of the River Cree Resort and Casino is. And so by the year 2000, Plans for Enoch's uh, entertainment resort development were nearly complete, and many of the key elements had already begun to fall into place. So in 2001, our community voted in favor of designating the lands for commercial purposes. Uh, that same year, the government of Alberta, excuse me, approved the First Nations gaming policy, which would allow for the licensing of on-reserve casinos and would also set out a revenue sharing model. Uh, the last thing we had left to do was get an administrative agreement in place with the City of Edmonton so that we could tie our resort into municipal services like water. We didn't really anticipate any problems with that because, of course, the City of Edmonton had 
similar agreements with other surrounding jurisdictions. And so when we approached Edmonton in May of 2001 to work out an agreement, uh, we were disappointed. Our request was met with significant apprehension from administrative staff at the city. There was no, to be fair, no precedent or template for dealing with First Nations, and they just weren't sure that they should treat First Nations the same as they would any other municipality. So it would take a year and a half before the city of Edmonton would agree to finally come and sit at the table with us. And when we finally did sit down, there were many concerns brought forward by Edmonton City Council. And I understand them. You know, while Enoch had consulted our own members about the project, we hadn't considered the, view, the views of our neighbours, and it was clear that that was a misstep on our part. While the city could do nothing to prevent us from developing our own land, they could prevent us or delay us from accessing the vital services that we would need to make any project viable. So in order for the city of Edmonton to consider the agreement, they tasked Enoch with going out and consulting with the adjacent neighbourhoods. And through that process, there were a number of concerns that were brought forward. Some of the concerns were related to the proposed height of the hotel and the negative impact to the landscape that it would propose. So we agreed to reduce the hotel from 13 to nine stories. Um, there were concerns about noise. So we agreed to increase the setback distance of the resort by more than four times. They were concerned about the negative impact that the resort would have on surrounding property values. So we agreed to create significant landscape buffers between existing residential areas to mitigate that. They were concerned about crime and traffic, so we entered into a spe uh, specific policing agreement with the RCMP that would cost us $1 million every year to provide policing services just for the resort. They were concerned that the city would spend tax dollars on natives. Enoch had already agreed to pay the full cost of infrastructure upgrades and all servicing costs. Plus, we would pay our bill six months in advance, and we would post numerous letters of credit to prove that we intended to pay our bills. So it took about two long years of consultation. There's a lot of negotiations and a lot of political tension throughout that time that was quite common in the media. But finally, the City of Edmonton approved a joint service agreement with Enoch in August of 2003. And by doing so, the city acknowledged that it would simply be treating Enoch the same as it treated other adjacent jurisdictions requesting the exact same services. So finally, with all the pieces in place, Enoch began construction of what would become the River Cree Resort and Casino. Uh, it opened in October of 2006, and quickly we became one of Western Canada's most successful casinos, injecting more than $1 billion into the regional economy through gaming revenues alone. You know, through our experience in developing the River Cree Resort, you know, we've learned that Enoch and Edmonton really do need to act together and plan together on issues that affect shared boundaries. We know that time spent sorting out differences after plans are made can translate into real dollars and lost revenues for business. You know, Enoch recognizes now that we have to be good neighbours if we want our neighbours to support us, and that means considering their concerns and acting to mitigate them. You know, we know that we have to do a better job at understanding one another from a governance and administrative perspective. I can say now that Enoch has a new understanding about the kinds of relationships that we have to have with other jurisdictions if we are to be successful. Um, it was time to reconcile our relationship with the city of Edmonton. Uh, fortunately, Edmonton Mayor Don Iveson and his council shared our views. Uh, some of you may know that Mayor Iveson was inducted as an honorary witness at the Truth and Reconciliation Commission in 2014. And shortly after that final event, he proclaimed the year to follow as a year of reconciliation for Edmonton. And true to his word, within that year, he sat down with Enoch Chief and Council, and we had some discussions about what reconciliation between the city and Enoch could look like. We agreed that a good place to start would be somewhere small, a small but meaningful gesture. And so after several months of consulting with Enoch Elders and the Edmonton Naming Committee, uh, Chief Morn and Mayor Iveson announced that a new arterial roadway in Edmonton would be named after Enoch, and it would be called Muskeksik Trail. So Muskeksik is the Cree and traditional name for Enoch, and it translates into the land of medicine. 
This would be the first time that Edmonton has ever honored and recognized our people in this way, and we've been living side by side for centuries. You know, the, the actions of reconciliation um, among leadership of, of both the city of Edmonton and Enoch Cree Nation really did trigger a cascade of goodwill. And we started to see administrative staff step forward with some innovative ideas about how we could advance our relationship together. And I'm gonna spend a couple minutes just sort of touching on what some of those uh, innovative ideas are. So one of these initiatives is the Boundary Interface Protocol. This is an administrative collaboration for joint land use planning around shared boundaries. Our staff meet regularly to coordinate our respective growth plans where it makes sense to do so and work out issues in advance of, of things that may affect our shared boundaries. You know, there was a time when Enoch was literally considered a black hole in the regional planning context. And now we are at the table and we're actually part of the bigger picture and that's exactly how it should be. The Community Economic Development Initiative, which uh, you know, my friend Scott here touched on earlier uh, this evening, is another collaboration that's designed to allow us to work on some joint projects that will benefit the economy as well as our residents. Uh, for this project, council and uh, senior administra administrative staff from Enoch and Edmonton met a couple different times, and the goal of those meetings was to narrow down the priorities where we would focus a joint economic project. Um, through those meetings, we agreed that a joint priority would be in cultural tourism and parks and recreation. So currently, we are coordinating efforts to lobby the provincial government to establish an urban provincial park within the River Valley. And if we're successful, this means that we will not only preserve a valuable ecosystem, but preserve green space where Enoch, people, like Enoch members and Edmonton residents can share that space for as long as time can, can provide us. And so it would also offer us an opportunity to share some of our history and celebrate our culture with Edmonton residents and visitors to the region through a number of different cultural tourism activities that an urban provincial park would provide for us. Uh, finally, in March 2017, uh, Enoch Cree Nation and the city of Edmonton made history by signing the Memorandum of Understanding that would really set out a framework of how we were going to work together to advance our mutual interests. Um, this MOU was viewed by most people as a significant advancement of our relationship with the City of Edmonton and a leap forward for reconciliation. Of course, there were people who were opposed to the MOU on the, on the basis that it derogated from treaty. But I stand firm by my decision to support this MOU. You know, in my view, we can either stay paralyzed, allowing our nation to become an island of economic despair in the name of treaty, or we can choose to lead our nation to a future of prosperity that I believe our treaty intended. And this requires partnerships like the one we have with the city of Edmonton. So I just wanna take a moment and reflect. So far, I've shared with you uh, a few examples of the kinds of decisions I have to make as a leader, such as those surrounding education and partnerships. I've shared some of the influences in, in my life that have shaped those decisions, such as Treaty 6, the TRC, uh, and I don't know more. And so before I close, I want to share with you one more and perhaps the most important factor that underpins every single decision I make every single day as a leader. And that, my friends, is the children. I was raised with the belief that if you put children at the center of every single decision you make, you will never go wrong. I don't make decisions just for today. I make decisions for children that will be born seven generations from now. About a year ago, I wanted to get a better understanding of what the vision for Enoch was through the eyes of our children. So I challenged the kids in our community to a poster contest, which would um, have them draw a picture of their vision for Enoch 100 years from now. This was Darius' vision. Darius wants Enoch to have lots of houses, a university, a McDonald's, and a park of awesomeness. <laughs> this tells me that Darius values community, 
He values education, and he values recreation. Haley is in grade five, and Haley wants to see hospitals, theaters, restaurants, and roads in Enoch. And this tells me that Haley values healthcare, business development, and infrastructure. Finally, this is Matthew. Matthew's in grade four, and Matthew's vision for Enoch includes tons of green space. There's a moose there, and I don't know, another moose, I think. <laughs> I guess he sees lots of moose. <laughs> but what this tells me is that value, you know, Matthew really values conservation, and he sees Enoch being a place where plants and animals can continue to have a home forever, and that's really important too. So the vision that these kids shared with me, this becomes my mandate. You know, their vision really does define the work that I have to do and the decisions that I have to make each and every single day. You know, long ago I had a passion for really nerdy things like geochemistry and atmospheric science. Um, but now my passion is really around nation building. To do this work, you know, I have to work extremely hard. I have to be kind, patient, and understanding with my people the best I can. I have to honor our past in establishing new visions for the future. And I have to challenge old ways of thinking. From where I stand, this is what leadership looks like. And I know that many of you students here tonight will become leaders at some point in your future. So I feel inclined to leave you with a little bit of parting advice. And that is that leadership is really about two things. It's about integrity and it's about people. You take care of those two things really well, and you're gonna be a really good leader. With that, I just wanna thank you so much for your time. Hi, hi. My life for sound good. <laughs> well, Michelle, thank you very much. That was wonderful. And uh, so much to think about. Um, when we talk about leading for the common good, it seems to me one of the themes throughout your conversation tonight and your presentation is that when we talk about the common good, it, who is the common good? Mm -hmm. who, who do we have to take into account? And in the same way that um, the treaty partners, the, the, the government of Canada and the, the non-Indigenous treaty partners, because as uh, Senator Marie Sinclair has said, we're all treaty people. Yes. I mean, it takes two to tango and it takes two to make a treaty. Mm -hmm. uh, so we're all bound by it. Uh, but that, it's, that very often we don't, we don't see ourselves as part of those relationships. We see ourselves as separate. <coughs> And on the other hand, you were talking about, you know, in your development of economic development, Enoch, that you know, seeing you're focused on your, on your own community and you don't see the connection. And so, one of the things it seems to me is is that your own uh, development has been a really interesting exploration of breaking down those boundaries to see the notion of what the common good is in a different way, not only as the re, as needing to push it for others, but also for yourself. Yeah, no, I, I would completely agree with that. And, you know, in challenging sort of those old paradigms around um, about what treaty really means, it's, you know, it's created um, some really tough conversations in our communities. You know, there'll be some of the older people uh, in our community and older leaders that will, you know, chastise you and if they could bring out the willow stick, they would, you know, for why are you working with the city of Edmonton or why are you working with the Catholic school board? And, and you know, there really just becomes a generational gap where I think that the people in my generation just have a different understanding. And I, I can't tell you why that is. I don't know if it's maybe because you know, my generation grew up in a different era that really celebrated indigenous rights and fought hard to recognize indigenous rights versus the generation prior which was really indoctrinated by the Indian Act. Um, that's speculation, but, but there is definitely, I think, you know, 
a difference and a separation in how we understand treaties within our own communities. So it's no, it's no surprise to me that, that Canadians don't quite understand what, what treaty implementation means either. Um, I should <clears throat> confess that uh, my first cabinet portfolio when I went to Ottawa was Minister of State for Indian Affairs and Northern Development. And um, uh, I remember always feeling very awkward to be in a position as I went around meeting with Indigenous communities, particularly in British Columbia, and I was later able to get the treaty negotiation uh, commission started, but although it hasn't had all that much in the way of results. Mm -hmm. But I think the, um, th when you talk about the, the concern about derogation and that dealing with other levels of government or other institutions might be used to undermine the, ra the rights with the, cr with the federal crown, the section 96 rights, um, or the, the, the rights un, 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 under, under the, the, the Constitution that you're dealing with, with the federal government's, federal crown's obligations. And yet if you look at the calls to action of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, those are not calls of action that can be satisfied only by the government of Canada. And so in a way, as you're talking about working with, with the province, we only to sit down, I mean, it's the province that has the jurisdiction in our country uh, for non-treaty people, for education. That's where the expertise is. That's where the, the understanding is how to build school systems, how to create accountability and education systems, uh, the school systems you know, in, in a city. That as we say, and you know, Dr. Krogman, Krogman in her introduction tonight talked about you know, how important it is for us and how she hoped the University of Alberta would be a constructive player in responding to those calls for action. Um, in a sense, First Nations have to allow other players to respond and to bring their expertise to the table. And somehow we need to find a way of reassuring people that that doesn't undermine the ultimate responsibility of the government of Canada, but maybe one of the reasons they've done such a bad job of it is it's not what they do. Mm -hmm. There's no department in Ottawa that knows how to run schools. Mm -hmm. You know, I've been there. Trust me, there isn't. Um, so, so when you, you make this, I mean, you know, there isn't the natural kind of set of expertise, whereas in the provinces there are. Yeah, you know, you're quite right, and I think that in order for you know the calls to action to be effective, I think we need to we need to draw on each other's strengths in accomplishing what, what they call us to do. And, you know, certainly I, I would agree with you, the last time that the federal government tried to implement education on reserves, it was residential schools was the result. So I'd rather that they don't get involved in First Nations education on reserve. But, uh, you know, but, but in all honesty, I think that part of the solution is actually, you know, indigenous communities and people and associations taking the time to educate ourselves about those calls to action mm -hmm. and maybe speaking with the commissioners about what was the intention behind those calls to action when they wrote them so that our own people understand the context of which they're given and it's not to derogate or abrogate from treaty, it's because a solution and reconciliation is an ongoing act that we all have to buy into and we all have to be a part of in some way. You know, I think even me being here tonight is an act of reconciliation. You know, this, this space allows for these students to bridge indigenous perspectives about leadership with that of the academic community. And that's important. So, you know, that's, that's part of the reason why I'm here tonight, because I feel like this is a way that I can contribute to reconciliation in this small way, and it's all meaningful. So you're quite right. I'm very curious, so going back to before your, your po politician and uh, social activism days, um, <laughs> you're being a geologist. Is there anything about your, because you obviously loved it. I mean, you mm -hmm. obviously studied it because it fascinated you. Is there anything about that that you see as either influencing how you've approached your, your life uh, post-geology or <laughs> your way of seeing things? How did it, how did it influence? Because it, it's, it's certainly part of you, and uh, you, must have, you must have loved it. I did. You know, it. It, it, it was a really cool job, I'll tell you that. I mean, I'd spend my days getting up, traveling in a helicopter, getting dropped off in some remote mountain, hiking around for 12 hours, looking at rocks, taking notes. Like it was, a, re like it a, was a really cool <laughs> job, um, you know, and, and it was rewarding. It was a, you know, well-paying job, um, but it wasn't, it wasn't spiritually rewarding. And I don't get nearly the same satisfaction out of that work that I do in the role that I am today. Um, but I can say that, you know, certainly the very limited experience I had in that, in that industry did afford me some insight into how industry works, 
how it relates to the Canadian economy, and where there are opportunities for Indigenous people and communities to participate in that economy. Mm -hmm. so, so it did provide me some, with some insight that I would use later on, for sure. When I, uh, I've had a couple of opportunities to do expeditions in the Arctic, and when you get above the tree line, mm -hmm. and there is nothing more magnificent than the geology that you see there when everything is just open. But the other thing too, of course, is that it really does confront you with this notion of time, mm -hmm. uh, how long it took to create these amazing uh, formations and how old they are. And um, I just wondered if it, if it influenced your sense of the need to uh, work for permanence or uh, go back to those ancient traditions or whether it was just Well, you know, I, I, think, I think part of the fascinating work, especially in the Arctic, mm -hmm. was that, you know, you'd be out there in these super remote areas where, you know, you could probably bet that maybe not a single person had ever stepped foot on before. Um, but eventually you would come across little markers or little things with the archaeologists on your team that would recognize them as being, um, you know, historic archaeological sites of, you know, the Inuit people that live there. And, you know, it is, it is a pretty big, wide, wide, you know, wide eye-opener in the sense that, you know, for all of us that think that we've, you know, especially for non-Indigenous people, I don't know if I can speak for you, but, you know, the sense that this is new and unexplored mm -hmm. territory, it's not. Like, this is, our people have been here you know, and that's why they use the term since time immemorial, because for as long as anybody can remember, our people have been here. And that connection to the land has always been there. And so when you hear a lot of Indigenous people talk about the significance of land and what treaty means with respect to land, you know, the Treaty 6, the, the, written, the written words of it talk about seed and surrender language. But it's impossible for Indigenous people to seed or surrender land they never owned. Its intention was to always share in, in the beauty and the significance of the land with, with the people that were coming and to be, and to be friends and sharing it. That's, was, that, that's what the intent of Treaty 6 was. Well, I was interested also in your, your discussion of coming back to Enoch after having been raised uh, uh, in, in British Columbia and the sense of uh, what you described yourself as a multi-generational survivor of the residential schools. And there's a lot of, you know, huge literature about Holocaust survivors and the children and even the grandchildren of Holocaust survivors, the people who've experienced terrible trauma, that it is something that remains with them. There's even some suggestion that there's a, even a physical reaction that comes from it. And I think for many of us, we don't necessarily, you know, make that, make that connection. How do you think... Um, you know, in, in terms of your own, your own experience, given that you actually went away and then came back, what were some of the things that struck you that, that made you feel that you, were, you should define yourself that way? Well, you know, with, with trauma, especially, especially in communities, especially in Indigenous communities, you know, the center of our communities are built around family and family structures. And what affects one person isn't an isolated event. It's going to affect um, family members and, and people that come after. There's actually, there's actually some teachings in our, in our culture that talk about trauma and talk about um, some, of the, some of the imprinting that happens when a, a baby's in the womb. So if you have a mother who's going through a traumatic experience, all of those feelings and the, and the chemicals and the hormones and all of that stuff that's coursing through a mom's body at the time that that trauma occurs is also you know, coursing through the, the veins of the baby. And so a baby can be born and, and have the DNA of the trauma that the mother was experiencing. So some of the recent studies around, um, you know, around trauma being passed on to successive generations, it's not only true in the science, but it's true in our teachings too. Mm -hmm. And so even though I, I moved away from the reserve and eventually came back, it didn't mean that I didn't experience that trauma even though I was removed from my community. In fact, I'd say maybe it was even heightened because I was experiencing it alone and outside of the connection of people that could share and understand in it with me. It's, um, I'm gonna open this to the audience for questions in, in just a second. I was gonna make one more, one more comment that when we did our, our uh, we do a full day workshop on indigenous issues in the first semester of, of, of the, the program. And last year there was a student who was talking about this question of, of you know, the, the Holocaust and, and destruction in the residential schools. And she said, but you know, how is it that you know, the Jews have been able to survive, et cetera? 
And I think that's a really interesting example that, uh, of comparison because the goal of the residential schools was to take the Indian out of the child, to make that break with the culture. The Holocaust was a terrible thing, but those who survived still had a culture and a mm -hmm. history that they could cling to to identify and rebuild. And I think there's a very interesting comparison to what it means to find yourself perhaps surviving a very bad experience, but not having the history, the lore, the language, right. the, the shared culture to, to support you and enable you to move. And that is, I think, a challenge that many First Nations communities are still dealing with, trying to recapture that and uh, internalize it again in a way that is strengthening and, uh, and supportive. So. Oh, absolutely. You know, my first, the first time I ever um, went into ceremony, I was about 20 years old. Mm -hmm. It was 20 years before I would, I would get to experience my first ceremony. And that really was the start of my own healing journey, mm -hmm. was when I was reintroduced to my culture and the ceremony that, that, that helped with those kinds of things. And so I think all the time about people that are living you know, outside of their communities that are living, even in urban centers, and there's a lot of them. Um, and I just, you know, I feel like we need to do more to allow to connect them you know, to, to the ceremonies and, and the culture because that is going to be an intrinsic part of our healing collectively as Indigenous people going forward too. So that's, that's quite right. And I think also the fact that we now, we acknowledge where we are in three times. I was just in Ottawa last week at a symposium celebrating, well, Canada 150, the Supreme Court of Canada. And somebody raised the question of whether this uh, recognition of the, the, in Ottawa would be treating one land, whether the, the Supreme Court should say that at the opening of the session, which is a very interesting, <laughs> a very interesting conversation. But I think that, the, that this notion of sharing the culture helps non-Indigenous people to really internalize the reality of the treaties as opposed to just being a kind of a pro forma um, recognition, we begin to internalize this notion that this, is, this really happened, this was a relationship, and uh, uh, we haven't always kept our side of the bargain. Mm -hmm. Anyway, I'm going to open it up to the audience, to, to students, particularly members of the community who are here, who would like to ask a question. Kelly, do we have, yeah, we have our, our throwable microphone here that you can, here's somebody's got a hand up here. We only do it so we can throw this microphone. It's I was going to say, I need to get one of those for the, our band meeting. They're the an awesome idea. idea. <laughs> yeah, I can toss it to you after. Um, so my, my question to you is about this notion of the greater good and the public good. Um, and I would argue that the notion of, the pub, of public good is quite subjective, right? Um, depending on our culture and depending on where we come from. Um, so in Western views, um, the notion of the public good is deeply anthropocentric and it's it's based on people and humans and families. Whereas I feel like in certain other cultures, it's not. It's, it's, there, there is integrity of the environment, regardless of whether people are there or not. Um, so based on your experiences in natural resource management, how do you think um, indigenous values have affected the way, or could affect the way in which we deal with the public good being broader than just people? Well, from from the perspective from an indigenous perspective, you know, I, I really appreciate your comments because you know that's quite that's quite accurate. You know, for for indigenous people, we can't disconnect ourselves from our environment. You know, we have we have beliefs that we are we we have kinship with plants with animals. We believe that everything has a spirit, and we actually feel that we have a responsibility to speak for the animals that cannot speak for themselves. Um, we can't, if, if I'm talking about greater good or you know, talking about the public as an Enoch Cree Nation people, we understand it intrinsically to also mean our environment that we survive within. So you're quite right about that. That's a good observation. I'm quite blind, so you really have to wave your, your hand up there. Can you see Here. this? You ready? Oh. And then there's somebody over there. Too. Thank you. I just want to really acknowledge you for uh, the many insights that you shared. Um, for myself personally, it was um, it it was very relevant in learning uh, the importance of the work that is taking place um, in terms of healing and in reclaiming the culture or being able to live that culture. I'm trying to understand how that looks uh, mm -hmm. for people um, to be participating economically 
and with, with all peoples and not in segregation? How does that look? Do you know? So is your question, how does healing look not just within the individual, but between Canada and Indigenous people? Is that the question? No, it's, it's more about the culture, like, you know, your cultural values. How, how do they show up now, you know? Right. Uh, within this new milieu now. Yeah, you know, that's, that's, that's a really good question. And that's actually something that we're still trying to work out at Enoch. You know, um, it was only in the past decade or so that the drum returned back to Enoch. We have the, the drum group now, River Cree Singers. Uh, for the first time in, I don't know, 100 years or something like that, the Sundance came back to Enoch. We're starting to see a lot more ceremonies come back. The pipe holders that have the right to conduct those ceremonies have come back. The bundles are coming home. Um, and I think that, you know, it's just, it's gonna take some time. And, and you know, we're really struggling with how do, we, how do we create a space in a modern society where people um, like a pipe holder or a healer can do that as their job. Like we can't, we live in a society now where people need money. They need money to pay their electricity bills, to buy food, to buy clothing to put gas in their car. So how do we support the healers in our community in doing the job that they do without bastardizing it by attaching a salary to it? And so that's, that's kind of a challenge is trying to bridge you know, traditional forms of healing with modern ways of survival. And, and it's, it's not easy and we're still trying to work our way through that. You know, with respect to language, we are uh, working towards a Cree language initiative, which is a 20-year strategy as to how we're going to improve the fluency of Cree speakers in our community. And we're, we're working with a number of different people, including some folks here at the U of A, to help, us, to help us do that work. And we're starting with little things. You know, if you come out to Enoch now, you'll see Naki, which is, you know, the word stop, along with stop on our stop signs, right? So we're just trying to do little things and make little efforts. It's baby steps. We're not going to get there overnight. But again, small, meaningful gestures can have huge impacts in terms of motivating people to, to move towards this new era where you know, our, our language and our culture will be central to the way that we govern. You know, I think one of the interesting things is that for those of us who you know, are kind of privileged to you know, have been able to, to live our lives without having those things questioned, we don't realize in how many sort of myriad ways we do things that reflect a culture, even if it's, for example, a religion we no longer follow, but in, you know, in holidays, traditions, expressions, uh, rituals around food, that, that these are just things that we take for granted that we've, that we've done. And yet, what, if you're separated from them, you have to go back and kind of rediscover them to reintegrate them into the vocabulary of your life. It's a, it's a challenge, but um, you know, we all have it. We just yeah. often aren't even aware of it. There was somebody with a light colored shirt there with a hand up. Do we want we throw you a, a lime colored microphone? There. Oh, great. And Ms. Wisdom, I really enjoyed your presentation. Thank you. <clears throat> so many First Nations communities are in far remote areas. And the trend for the last 250 or 300 years since the start of the Industrial Revolution has been away from the countryside, away from the remote areas, into the towns, from the towns, into the cities. And it's, it has been happening worldwide, in China, in India, everywhere. Given that, if you're trying to make these remote communities more viable, are you not perhaps swimming against the tide of history? You know, I, I guess it all maybe boils down to what the definition of viable is. You know, I think that I think that if your goal is wealth, if it's wealth defined by cars and nice houses and gold watches and those kinds of things, then yeah, maybe it's going to be a lot harder to achieve that kind of viability in, in remote areas of Canada. But if you're talking about you know wealth in terms of culture, if you're talking wealth in terms of you know, having healthy children, of having a resurgence of our language, of, of course everyone should have housing and, and clean water and those kinds of things, but 
you know, it's, it, you're at, it's absolutely a challenge, you know, for communities that are in remote areas. And, and you know, I think that the economic opportunities in those areas are more focused around, uh, you know, natural resources. And they struggle so much because, as, you know, I'll just throw it out there, because Canada refuses to share natural resource revenues with Indigenous communities, and they should be. That's what, in my mind, the treaty was intending for them to do. And, and as long as Canada stays greedy and keeps taking all that money, of course indigenous communities in those areas are going to continue to struggle because they're not, they're not sharing in the wealth of those, of those areas. So it, you're absolutely right, it's more difficult, but that's a policy decision that, that Canada continues to make. We have time for one more question before we break for our, uh, is there somebody back there in the community? I can't see very well, okay, I'll let Kelly. There she goes. <laughs> you never thought that a Lahi lecture would be part of your fitness program. Uh, okay, all right, that's how this works. Well, first of all, thank you for coming. Um, you actually came on a very good day because I feel like I could learn a lot from you. Um, how do you deal with opposition from within your own community? Because we've... Because I care about my peers and I want to do my best to make sure they're safe, but they may not agree with what I want to do and I may not agree with some parts of what they want to do. How do you compromise with that? Oh, you know, that's a good question and <laughs> I have a lot of experience with opposition within the community, I'll tell you that much. Um, you know, at the end of the day, all you can really do is, is try to build an understanding. Um, and often accept the fact that there's always going to be disagreement. You're never going to agree on everything all the time. That's not the nature of indigenous communities. That's not the nature of any community anywhere in the world, in the history of the world. Not everybody agrees on everything. And, and that's you know, deriving from the uniqueness of us as individuals, and, and that's okay. You know, but I think that if you can, you know, agree to disagree on a respectful basis, then you can continue to work together on things that you do agree on and, and focus on those strengths and, and, and those things, and that's how you move forward. Um, but one thing I will tell you, <coughs> compromise is a good thing, especially when you're trying to arrive at solutions, but never if it includes compromising on values. I never compromise on values, never. And that would, be my, that would be my advice to you. Well, this has been a very interesting conversation and uh, happily, uh, some of our students will now continue the conversation in their master class with Councillor Wilsden and the others will be uh, pursuing the ideas in their forums. Thank you to all the people in the community and elsewhere in the university who come and join us in our Lahey College lectures. You are very welcome and hello to our, our live streaming partners at McEwen and Augustana and Red Deer College. Um, thank you for coming. I'd like to, to invite you to uh, express your appreciation to, to Councillor Michelle Wilson and then I'll ask Dr. Krogman to perhaps announce what our next Lougheed College lecture is going to be and when it's going to be. But Michelle, thank you so much. <laughs>